Hello, I'm Elliot Zareski Williams, CTO and co founder of Neuralist, and today we'll be talking about the Neural Lambda Machine Software 2.0 and the revolution of commercial machine learning applications. So before we get into all that exciting stuff I just mentioned, let's talk about exactly what deep learning entails. So deep learning is really a subfield of machine learning, and it's really concerned with the analysis of deep neural network design and the techniques associated with building them and you know, the creation and performance, right? So in 2010, this is, or 2010 to 20, through 2020, deep learning really saw an explosion of jobs needing to get filled, as well as billions and billions of dollars of re research and development across, you know, not just the U.S., but all, all over the world. This does not really come as a surprise to anywhere in the tech space. People have sort of heard similar numbers, uh, similar figures for, for, for that time period. So really, machine learning and deep learning, has this, or deep learning, uh, falls into three subdomains. And of course, I say, I say that because both machine learning and deep learning techniques can be used for all three of these categories, but deep learning is where we saw a lot of really exciting success in the last uh, last 10 years. So let's go over these three subdomains. So we have supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. So what exactly do each of these entail? So for supervised learning, this is really just training models on labeled data. So something has a specific you know group that it belongs to, typically, or just has some kind of value associated with a data point. So for classification, let's just say you're trying to build something to classify cats versus dogs. For regression, it could be you know, data forecasting, time series analysis or object detection, which is really a combination of both, or can be a combination of both. And we have some major successes in supervised learning. Of course, one of them is going to be uh, the fact that for computer vision, we really had models like ResNet, you know, VGG, you know, uh, it, it was at the um, inception, lots of great computer vision models. And these were, of course, trained on the ImageNet data challenge, which is essentially a big computer vision challenge, which had, uh, which the task was build some kind of algorithm that can classify 1.2 million images divided into 1,000 groups uh, as accurately as possible. And, you know, we also have in natural language processing, that's what NLP stands for, uh, BERT, and uh, more, more, more recently GPT-3 that's uh, not labeled here. Uh, so these are big successes for natural language processing, and, of course, I encourage everyone to, you know, to, to look up those, those models. And, of course, for object detection, we have the, the YOLO model. That's uh, for us, you only look once. So... Despite these successes, there are some limitations, uh, one of them being adversarial attacks, and these are essentially where you essentially craft some noise, and you basically add the noise to a data point in an effort to fool a neural network into predicting something you wouldn't want it to ordinarily predict. For example, again, doing cats and dogs, let's say you add some small amount of noise to the cat and never thinks it's a dog. That would be a successful ad adversarial attack, and this is you know, a very hot area of research, uh, you know, because it's a very practical uh, concern. And of course, transfer learning, this is essentially where you train a network on one data set and your goal is sort of uh, extend what it learned in that one data set to another data set without having to retrain the entire model from scratch. Oh, you know, we've had some success with it, but it's still somewhat limited in what it can do. Uh, usually training a model from scratch does perform really, really well, but that does require a lot of examples typically. And of course, just interpreting results of the model is a little tricky because it's not exactly always clear how the network is learning from layer to layer. We have some techniques to visualize what's going on, but again, it's not 100% clear what's really happening. So. In unsupervised learning, the whole goal here is to really find hidden patterns and structures within our data set. And of course, for in the deep learning space, uh, that's autoencoders and GANs. You know, in traditional machine traditional machine learning, this is typically done with something like you know PCA, which is you know principal component analysis. You know, so like k-means, you know, finding clusters. And of course, we also have GANs for the, for, for for deep learning. So autoencoders, what do they do, right? So they really encode the data. And basically, the whole point of them, they essentially try to learn a representation of the data in a lower dimensional setting. So essentially, you're only you're compressing the data set to only the most essential aspects, and then you're reconstructing the data set from those essential aspects. And the second key area of success was image image synthesis, and this is what the GANs are really famous for. You know, generating very realistic looking images. And of course, some limitations here are that it's kind of challenging to form good uh, objective functions to optimize. Uh, for GANs, you know, you can you can see this, see this especially because there are so so many different formulations of GANs and different ways people have considered optimizing them. And a lot of them have pros and cons. And so it's not always clear exactly what the best way to formulate these problems are. Now, and the third category is reinforcement learning. And this is a little different from the other two because you are essentially teaching an agent to interact with its environment to maximize some notion of reward. And so typically this is, you know, use cases for this really include something like control problems, uh, stock trading. Uh, one big success that I think really dwarfs all the other ones are AlphaGo, where essentially reinforcement learning algorithms were used to uh, beat uh, the world-class Go player, uh, the world champion of Go specifically. And 
the issue with reinforced learning is that sometimes it can be uh, time consuming or they have unstable training dynamics and uh, in terms of how the agent actually learns. And that's why there's so many different variations and you have to consider things like training time, performance, uh, you know, RAM issues. There are a lot of considerations that go into choosing a reinforcement learning algorithm. A lot of things that can go wrong. So it's not always exactly easy to set up reinforcement learning to be practical and you know, very user friendly. So at the heart of all three of these, backpropagation, right? So backpropagation has actually been around for several decades. I believe it was in the 1980s, and I believe it was Jeffrey Hinton, and someone correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was Jeffrey Hinton who, who invented uh, or was one of the main founders of backpropagation. So, but let's just kind of focus on exactly what backpropagation really does and, and why it's so important. So backpropagation really can optimize any deep learning framework. So that's the power of it, really. Whether you're doing convolutional neural networks for image classification, or trying to model some kind of time series with a recurrent neural network, or even just doing something even more fancy kind of tension mechanism, which is, can be used for time series or natural language processing. It's really, you know, it's, uh, it's a cool architecture I won't get too into right now. But no matter what deep learning architecture you choose, backpropagation optimizes all of them. So what really this boils down to is if you have a problem and you have a network, no matter what network you choose, regardless of the architecture, backpropagation is how you get to your goal. That's how you optimize the network to solve a task at hand. And that doesn't really matter whether you're doing supervised learning, reinforcement learning, or unsupervised learning, you are just, you're going to be backpropagating uh, to, to optimize the parameters of interest. So really, this again segues right nicely into this slide, reformulate and backpropagate. So many models are actually mathematically equivalent, but for various practical considerations, one outperforms the other. We especially see this with CNNs versus uh, regular dense, you know, vanilla neural networks. Um, they're designed for image classification because they take into consideration local features of an image. And by local features, I mean pixels that are neighboring each other typically are correlated with, uh, with what the object actually is. So we sort of, again, that's an engineering trick. But regardless, you're still just kind of backpropagating through through, through all the networks, and they're going to get the goals you you're going to reach the goal you want to typically if it's designed if the network is designed well. So, and really creating these state of the art models has really required a lot of clever engineering tricks in the domain of machine learning. But really, the back prop lets you focus on just the loss formulation, the data, and the data at hand, and then you really design your model architecture to make the most use out of back propagation. Like again, for image classification, you choose CNNs typically because of their inherent uh, engineering, um, I guess, how should I, how should I phrase this? I say they're inherently designed to handle images. So you choose a model architecture that makes best use of back propagation to, to solve the task, which will be classifying as many images correctly uh, as possible. So in 2010, let's sort of, sort of summarize what went on in 2010. Uh, so in computer vision, you know, ImageNet challenge was, was huge. You know, this is where people, you know, just kind of build better and better models to classify ImageNet. And, you know, I encourage everyone to look up some of these cool models that were designed. But they required lots of very sophisticated architecture. But we've come a very long way uh, in 2010 in, for computer vision. And that was, a lot, I think, largely, in, in, largely due to ImageNet challenge, really motivating a lot of this research effort. And, of course, for natural language processing, we have BERT and, again, GPT-3, which I didn't list here. But those are, you know, common natural language processing uh, uh, techniques that, 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 that people uh, have, have used. And the next thing is the attention mechanisms. And this was a very cool new architecture that's turned out to be extremely useful in a wide variety of tasks. And I won't touch on them here uh, too much, but I think, but I just want to get to the last one. And that's the invention of the neural Turing machine and the differential neural computer. And these are really, I think, the fundamentally the most significant R&D developments um, uh, in, in 2010, and they were done in 2016 and then in, 20, in 2018. So the neural, and basically these are, we're going to talk a little bit more about them, but these really answer the question, what if my problem in, in, that I want to solve is not necessarily me trying to group something together or find patterns in the data or learn something, learn some kind of agent uh, to, to solve a sequence of, basically go through an environment and optimize its performance. What if it's something like I want to solve or develop an algorithm to solve a problem? That's what these models aim to address. And we're going to talk we're going to talk more about them in a second. We'll just sort of go over very quickly some engineering developments. And these developments are largely responsible for why machine learning became more mainstream and why you see people developing and uh, developing these uh these tools and you know we really see machine learning kind of coming out into many industries. And that's essentially what 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 what's going on. So one big of course advancement was the G fact that the GPUs, right? So NVIDIA. So this was this really speeds up dramatically how quickly you train deep learning models. And of course, then we have open source libraries like PyTorch and TensorFlow. You now these really help build the models themselves. And you know, deploy. And then of course, now we have cloud and edge computing, and that lets you train and deploy models into production. So now industries and you know stakeholders and really anyone interested in practically applying deep learning, they can now 
use this cloud infrastructure to deploy these and deploy these, and then it can actually work in real time. Uh, let's one classic example. Let's say you wanted to detect some pests in a crop field. You technically could train an object detection model uh, to recognize these certain pests. And if you deploy it in the cloud, you know now you have a practical application of object detection. It's not just simply in the lab. It's not just theory. People actually have made really good use of this, and people you know are gonna are poised to make a lot more good use of this uh, in the future. So, like I was saying, the big challenge for 2020 is we're going to address the problem I was talking about earlier, how we want to learn algorithms rather than just learning, you know, the questions that we've been asking ourselves in 2010s. And the differential neural computer especially, uh, which that's what DNCs stand for here, I may mean, really address the fundamental barriers of traditional deep learning. And we can't really appreciate all those uh, barriers that it addresses, um, but it, it really, it does. So how exactly would we learn an algorithmic process in a reliable way that can be uh, applied practically to lots of different domains right, of software engineering. For example, let's just say we have some kind of graph and we want it, like let's say the graph represents a, a metro system. Uh, and then you want to, let's say, find the shortest path between two points on a metro system. And what if we wanted to then say, input a new metro system and find the shortest path between there? Of course, you know, we have algorithms that do this, but what if we want to learn that process so we didn't have to write an algorithm if we did not have one? That's really a question that different, different general computers uh, and neural training machines aim to solve. And so, you know, really this, the way these work, they input data structures and, you know, values, values associated with these data structures. And that is going to be uh, the main focus we're going to be talking about for the rest of this presentation. So a neural Turing machine was, like I said, built in 2016. Uh, it was done by Google DeepMind. Alex Graves is the, I guess, primary inventor, maybe the only inventor. And the neural Turing machine really decided to say, okay, a Turing machine, what is that, right? That's like a universal model of computation, or it, not like is a universal model of computation. And so the neural Turing machine, the idea was to sort of make that process differentiable. So it wants to essentially learn how to solve a solve an algorithmic problem is essentially what really neural Turing machines are all about and they have all the components that you would need to solve a problem and uh if you go to our website at neuralist we link to uh deep minds blogs which sort of goes into this in more depth because of course there's way too much to talk about uh here but i'm trying to keep the presentation relatively short and we'll see how that goes uh but that's really what the purpose of the neural Turing machine was and then of course later on in 2018 there was an improvement on that called the differential neural computer and you see here there's a nice little gift that that's included and essentially the neural, differential neural computer was an upgrade so essentially you have mechanisms for reading reading writing and storing memory and essentially these are you know done with recurrent neural networks uh behind the scenes and the idea is they essentially learn how to you know solve 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 algorithmic problem that's really ultimately what, what, what these do and you kind of see a nice little gif there essentially is a, there are a whole bunch of weights that control reading and writing and, and recalling from memory. And, and because it can be learned in a differential process, we're, how do we optimize this? We do backpropagation. So really what it's saying is we can use backpropagation to, to really learn how to solve uh, software problems. So, and, and of course, this is sort of, I think at this point, starting to become a little more clear. What's the big deal here? You know, differential neural computer is Turing complete, and I believe the neural Turing machine is also Turing complete. So it can really reprodu reproduce any computable program. So, and what implications here, of course, are, are are staggering, right? Because if we input some kind of data structure, we can learn a program which then transforms that into a target structure. So, and like if we wanted to, let's say, formulate our output of this of this device as a graph, um, we can learn abstract syntax trees, which then completely describe the syntax of a certain programming languages. And what this means, if you if you want to be practical here and focus just on that, this lets you essentially input data and then output a, a working source code that would be something that a human engineer would write. So like if you want to sort arrays, you essentially would, you know, you would input your arrays and you would out output a program in human readable code that would sort the arrays. And it's a completely learned process. You don't need to have a human engineer design that. And this graphic really summarizes this, right? So your input is an array. Typically, you know, software now, you know, you have a software engineer write a sorting algorithm, and then you, know, you output a sorted array. That's typically, that, that's how it was done, right? And software 2.0, you replace the need to write the actual code with a deep learning framework. Of course, the, this, uh, this deep learning framework, like, like a differential neural computer, could, of course, generate source code in addition. But it's not strictly needed because it's learning how to solve the problem itself. So if, as long as you input the data structure, you output the correct data structure, which in this case is a sorted array. 
And of course, a neural list, there is something called a neural, we have an alternative that I, that I personally designed um, called a neural lambda machine. And so pretty much it's, it's a little bit more practical, I think, and it's rapidly appro approaching commercial release. And so the difference in a neural computer, uh, it really is, it takes a more object-oriented approach. And I say that in quotations because it basically uh, treats computers as, as state machines. And the idea is that you input some kind of state and you tr and use the differentiable neural computer to transform the state of your data into the target data. Now, the neural lambda machine takes a more functional-based approach. So really, it's, you know, we input something into a program. The program is sort of a black box. And then we want to learn the program that way. And of course, this takes inspiration from lambda calculus. And lambda calculus is really just, you know, a mathematical theory describing uh, how, co how computers work. You have some input, you have some black box, and, you know, you output, you output the do your desired value. And of course, this is developed by Alonzo Church, uh, who I believe actually was uh, Alan Turing's PhD thesis advisor. But that's really the, those are really the main differences. And uh, but if, um, fundamentally, but some Going, touching on some more architectural differences, uh, DNCs are based on lots of RNN modules, um, and I, these are not necessarily desirable because there are some uh, gradient problems here. Like there could be vanishing, exploding gradients, uh, and that may not may not necessarily always play a role uh, in, in the problem at hand, but that could potentially be an architecture drawback. I haven't found anything uh, myself where suggesting that this has been you know adequately addressed, but maybe it has, maybe it hasn't. This is just something to keep in mind. Now. Uh, by contrast, neural lambda machines or NLMs, well, they only care about transforming the input to the output. So we have data, we want to transform it to the output. So we're kind of our program, quote unquote, is really just the neural lambda machine. We just want to input the data and get the data you want out. And that's exactly inspired from lambda calculus like I was talking about. Now, they're also, the way I designed them, they also have mechanisms that are designed to train faster and less data, but they're also, however, sensitive to the choice of optimization technique. Uh, coincidentally, actually, that the optimization uh, optimizer used for neural turning machines and neural lambda machines both happen to be uh, the best one so far I found is, R, is RMS prop. And that seems to be what was in the neural turning machine paper as well. Now, of course, these one thing that's also interesting is that both DNCs and L NLMs can also be applied to reinforcement learning based problems. Uh, NLMs, you know, have applications to supervised and unsupervised learning as well, although I will not focus on those applications in, in this presentation. So in, in the experiments that, that I'm going to show here, uh, we really trained the NLM on arrays of length 30. Uh, right now, it's handling fixed size arrays. And the whole point is we're trying to get it to sort uh, those elements. And the random numbers are 1 through 50. That That is essentially saying we have an array that has 30 elements. And at each index can take some number between 1 and 50. And we'll show that the NLM learned to generalize not only to unseen arrays, but uh, but to arrays of different positive integer values that was not that was not trained on. And it could even sort uh, most elements in arrays with negative integers. And this is in the case where you don't train with negative integers. If you were to train with negative integers, it could then generalize those as well. But it's, you can you show that it's not strictly needed to, to train on negative integers for it to generalize the sorting process itself to negative integers, even though it's never seen them before. Let's, let's look at some results. So in this experiment, you know, we have, uh, this is just kind of a, a little screenshot. You know, we have a t ten, 10 arrays that are, you know, fed into the neural lambda machine. And then notice that we have numbers uh, ranging one through zero, sorry, zero through 50 in, in, in this case. And these are sort of our, our test arrays. Now, here's a little side-by-side -side comparison. I'll leave this up for a second so people, people can take a look. And so we see that the sorted arrays, which are the true sorts, you know, done by, you know, traditional sorting algorithms and the predicted arrays. These predicted arrays are what the neural lambda machine outputs as the correct sort. And of course they're all they're all correct here. And of course you know feel free to pause the video and take a look at them to confirm. But that's uh, that was of course one this is one one result. Let's sort of just take a little look, a peek behind the curtain. Of course, we're not going to give away exactly how this all works exactly, but essentially this required a, a proprietary attention mechanism that utilized residual connections. And essentially, the, some of the modules inside this attention mechanism learn abstract representations of the computational process through time, and other, other uh, convolutional-based modules take advantage of some of the quote-unquote local features of representation. And basically... Long story short, that works. And so, if the program itself, um, the program itself, and by program I mean the program that's learned, is intricate encoding uh, that requires communication from many parts of the model. So this is sort of a visualization of, of the three uh, of three different neural lambda machines uh, that are being trained. So the first one is optimized for stochastic gradient descent, and these are, these are of course are optimized on those third arrays of length 30, integers 0 through 50, and you can sort of see the training process. Now the RMS prop is the one I want to call attention to because that's the one that is actually performing the best. This is the one that actually led to the sorted arrays in, in, our, in the experiments. So you see that the confidence um, in the upper right-hand corner is uh, primarily green, and basically when it's a green, that means that it actually has 100 
is confident that the what it's predicting is actually accurate. So that's how you can know that the algorithm you're learning is reliable. And this actually also is responsible for uh, a different mechanism, which actually makes the program run faster later on. So the confidence is, is really what is, is cool to look at. Now, if you notice the other components of the NLMs uh, for SGD and Atom, they're both, uh, they're, you can see that it's learning a little differently. They're, they're both not learning in a really optimal way. I tried tweaking the learning rates uh, of, 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 of the training procedure, but they, they didn't seem to learn quite as well as RMS prop. So, you know, here are some more uh, little pictures, you know, here, you know, we, we do, um, you know, the integer zero through 50, uh, you know, some, just some 10 samples. Uh, this is, of course, um, when we when we train our program, essentially, our neural lambda machine will output a program, and then we essentially then feed that program through this little function that I wrote in Python, you know, run example, and then we essentially just see that it can predict new arrays that has not seen before at all, um, even during the validation stage or the training stage, and we see that it sorts it correctly. And notice on the right-hand side, we now extend it to integers from, let's say, zero to nine. And notice that it was not trained on integers from 0 through 90. And yet, even so, it still generalized the sorting process to these integers. And of course, even if you go to 300, this, 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 the same process happens. And the, uh, the, in the in the initial prototype, which has been, since been fixed a little bit, um, it's been tweaked, but this is... Notice in this case, if, the, if we go from negative integers, not all elements are sorted correctly. However, most are sorted correctly. So it still is able to capture enough of the fundamental sorting process that even though it has never seen negative integers, doesn't really understand how to process them, it still could sort a lot of the integers correctly anyway. And of course, in, in, in if we were to train on these, then we would see the confidence in our in our in our NLM uh, sort of you know bounce around a little bit until it felt confident it, it could sort. But it hasn't seen this before, so it really was not confident that it, it doesn't really know these exist yet. So really, in, in the current status is we're really just kind of upgrading the architecture, and we're going to test it out on some algorithms below. Uh, so, so far, one of these actually has been tested, and it works pretty well, and that's the fast Fourier transform, and we'll uh, talk about that a little bit more later at the end. Um, pretty much, you know, some algorithms will be, let's say, shortest path in directed and undirected graphs, you know, detecting cycles in graphs, maybe uh, matrix factorization, and, you know, some other ones that are in the pipeline. These, of course, will be published on our website, so you can see the NLM learning these processes in real time and testing it, and ideally, you won't have people actually themselves input the structure uh, into the NLM through an API and say, you know, and look and see for themselves that it actually works. And so pretty much, you know, the, and ultimately we're going to incorporate this into our into our main app uh, in, 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 the med in the short to medium term. Like let's say we want a classification model, you know, like, you know, or I want to remove noise from my signal readings or find all pests in the field. You know, this falls under more traditional uh, machine learning tasks, but the neural lambda machine actually is able to uh, learn which model you, the user would want to have based on just the query that they, they, they give into our into, into neuralist. That, of course, is going to require a little more development to make that fully practical. But that just sort of gives an idea of how we're actually going to integrate the current version of the neural lambda machine into what we already have. So to recap, to sort of rephrase what I was saying, we're simply just wanting to uh, take the neural the neural lambda machine, have it learn how to choose models for the user without even having to input any hyperparameters. That's really the, that's kind of a, a, a again a short to medium term goal. And of course, a uh, software 2.0, which is of course I hinted at the very, very beginning. You know, that's really where you don't need a software engineer to write the code for you. The user would be so would do something like, let's say, I want a, I want a program that does blank, right? And so this is a query. And so using a natural language processing based model, neurons will sort of translate their query into one that the NLM can understand. And then the NLM will prompt the user for data types, the data itself, and the formats. And then they're going to prompt them for the end goal. And then it's going to also give ask it for a few uh, samples that are correct so it knows what to expect. And then, of course, the appropriate out out output type. And you know, we query the model as necessary. And from there, user simply hits a button and trains the NLM, and the NLM will output a working program. And ultimately, we want to have the source code be out, the, the source code uh, as well. So if I wanted to write, let's say I had a, I want to write multiple sorting algorithms, you know, let's say I want to sort negative integers, positive integers, um, you know, I don't know, different kinds of, of groupings of, of numbers. Let's maybe want to sort primes to composites. I want to learn all those processes and I want to not write any code for it. The neural the machine would be able to first output the working programs, um, program or programs, depending on the problem at hand, and it will generate the source code as needed uh, f f for that. So, of course, the, the, the software 2.0 API that we're going for is, you know, let's say the user will, like I said, input uh, some kind of query, what they want, what kind of algorithm of task they want to do. They have a user-friendly GUI, which you can see on our website, um, both with our alpha release, you know, how the GUI looks like. It probably will undergo some moderate changes, but more or less the spirit of what you see in the alpha is what we're, what we're aiming for. And, of course, you know, then the API sends the, pro, uh, you know, the first, first actually, the top arrow 
we're going to translate user goals into a form that the NLM can understand. You know, we're going to query the model. Then it's going to be sent uh, into through the cloud through an API. Then those instructions are going to get translated to the NLM. The NLM will train and run and test. You know, get a good confidence, and then we'll send the working program back up through the API into Neuralist and finally into a pro into uh, something the user can use. So now they can input the data, they feed into the NLM. The NLM is sort of this black box program that they that they, that they trust can work. Um, and if they don't, if they want more than that, they can get source code that they can run themselves. That's really the API we're going for. And that's, again, uh, more of a, that's a medium term goal, I would say. Of course, funding would accelerate this process dramatically, uh, but that's a more medium term goal that we're, that we're working on. And, you know, when can I use this, actually, like I was talking about? So this will be available in the full release only and, of course, for the highest tier. So if you pre-order Neuralist and you're into that project, then customers will be eligible for a significant discount. Um, that's something that you have to contact us directly to learn more about, and we'll be happy to tell you about it. And, but of course, in the full release, our goal will be able to handle uh, graphs, arrays, matrices, and be able to generate some source code for basic programs. Of course, this is going to be an ambitious undertaking. A lot of stuff has to go into this. We want to make sure that we have a really good product to roll, to roll out. But this is, uh, this is kind of our goals. At least we want to have something that's user-friendly user friendly and practical enough that people would use it upon the full release of Neuralist. And uh, thanks for tuning in, guys. And here's just a quick little video of the, just me running the Neuralanda machine. And you can kind of see, I'm just going to fast forward through some of the parts. Uh, we see that... Um, let me just kind of go down here. Yeah, we see that we are sorting. So you see here that we're in the first two predicted. The sorts are not correct, but you'll see soon that actually it will uh, flip over to being uh, being correct. So I'm just going to let it play for a second. Right, so you see now at this point it has already correctly sorted. I'm going to actually skip over closer towards the end so we can skip the second uh, epic of training. Uh, and we are going to go to the test. And you see here now, this is a completely new arrays. You know, this, this arrays, you know, was, uh, I believe 0 through 400 I entered. And you see that it was not trained in those arrays initially, if you go back to the beginning of the video, and you see it sorting in real time. And th this is ultimately what we're going for, not just with sorting, but really algorithms in general. The neural end of the machine is equipped to handle uh, a wide variety of, of, of algorithms. It's just simply we need to write the code to be able to handle these different data structures appropriately. So... And that's pretty much uh, all for this presentation. I have a blog, a blog post associated with this where I sort of talk about these ideas again. So thanks for tuning in, everyone. I hope you guys enjoyed this presentation and you're excited about Neuralist machines and what we offer. And uh, you know, please consider uh, signing up for Neuralist. And uh, I'll we will be rolling out content um, as 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 time permits. So uh, thanks, thanks for tuning in.